Okay, this is Apostolic Centers, session three. So session one and two, what have we learned so far? Every, um, every uh, Monday there's two sessions. So last week was two sessions, this is two sessions. <laughs> Basically chapter three. So we try to cover a chapter each. Okay, last um, week we started with chapter one from our book. I believe everybody has one, has a book. It's good, good, good. It's, it's a relatively new concept, but it's actually the original concept of how to do church. <clears throat> so it might be new to some of us, but all we have to do is really look, open up the book of Acts, and uh, that's where we learn all about an apostolic center. And this is part of the reformation of the church, as we see started quite some time ago. And we've seen constant reformation and different truths being um, emphasized by the Holy Spirit. It started with basic truths such as salvations by faith, faith in God alone. That was something that was lost under Roman Catholicism. Catholicism. And so uh, from then we had different truths restored. And I, from my study of history and studying others who study history of the church more in depth than I do, you know, we're con coming into that full, the fullness of times where all things are restored to the way it was in the beginning. Maybe not in every church, in every denomination, but worldwide, we can expect the church to operate like we see in the book of Acts. That's exciting to me. And so um, one thing that's being emphasized as of late, lately like last course, we learned about the office of the apostle and how the office of the apostle serves the local church. All five gifts were given by the Lord, who was all five gifts in one. When he ascended, he descended these gifts for the church so that certain ones would have a grace to equip each other to mature, to grow, to develop, so that we can all represent Christ in all of his fullness together as his body. And so the role of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are all to serve in the local church, not just to be itinerant ministries. And even those who have itinerant ministries should be have a strong local church that sends them. And so this concept of apostolic centers is really that. It's a sending base. That's where ministries and missions should be sent from where they have a real strong, solid support. Not just a financial support. Local churches do send out missionaries, support them, but much deeper than that, where that person that's sent out is really still seen as part of that church. It's almost like any kind of business that starts to become international, and now you are employing people in other nations <laughs> or in other territories. Your business is not just a small business. Now it's becoming a corporation and it's being established all over the place. So the apostolic center is that kind of idea is that God is going to raise people and send them out all over the world. And as we see, as we're going to see in Acts chapter 13, Antioch becomes that model church. So not every church is called to be an apostolic center, but I believe every church is called to be connected to one. So we're going to really go in depth on that tonight, but the first um, week, last week, we, chapter one was my journey into the apostolic, and if you read it, you learned about the author and his journey, uh, my own journey, shortly after salvation in 1995, I um, got in, as I read through the Bible, nobody really discipled me except for the Holy Spirit, which isn't a bad person to disciple you. <laughs> um, but it's good to have people also. God works through his body, so it's ideal to have fathers and mothers in the faith. 
and those I've, de- I've developed over time. But initially, it was just Holy Spirit and I just reading the Word. Even though I was raised Catholic, I don't remember really, you know, having to unwind or, you know, remove stuff out of me. It, it didn't really hit. I wasn't really paying attention <laughs> as a boy. I didn't really, I didn't care, per se. Um, so, as I read through the Bible, especially the New Covenant, I constantly said the, see the word apostle, and it just was highlighted to me. And so, I couldn't find much resources on anything about apostles or apostolic back in the late 90s. So, I started to find a few, but it was probably in 2001 or 2002, the book that really impacted me more than anything besides the Bible which the book had plenty of scripture in it, was, um, it was called, Ap- I should know it since it's such an important book to me. <laughs> Apostolic Strategies Affecting the Nations by Jonathan David. I still have it. It's about a 700-page book. And I read it in one week because it was like I was finding my DNA like rediscovering, like DNA was discovered. Well, that's what's inside of me. Oh, now I get it. Now I get me. Apostolic Strategies Affecting the Nations, I believe, by Jonathan David. So it's a big, thick book. And if this topic don't interest you, it's probably going to be hard to read. <laughs> but for me, I was glued. And since then, you know, I've, I uh, went through saying, okay, I need to find an apostle to, to grow under to be aligned to, and so back, I think, in 2007, I uh, discovered Walt Healy and, and um, Church of Grace and Peace up in Tom's River, and aligned myself with him, and started meeting with him monthly, one-on-one, and then meeting with a small group of leaders, and then Jeff Beecham came into the story. He was actually part of that church at that time, and, and he was another apostolic leader who poured into me and would also have lunch with me monthly and take me to all kinds of places around the country, and um, then I did uh, schooling through um, Wagner Leadership Institute with uh, my focus being the apostolic, so that was my journey, and then when I was sent here in 2004, that's what I felt I was called to do, help this ministry transition into an apostolic center, so, uh, and now as of last year, I've laid that out with the elders, <laughs> And yeah, I kept it under, kept it under wrap to the right time. And you're going to see that whole process, how that's common with, it's just the timing. And it was just the timing. It was just the now time. And it's so far been pretty well, well received. There hasn't been a lot of um, meetings with people that try to, you know, help them figure it out. Like, I don't get this. I need to go to another church, you know, whatever, <laughs> that kind of stuff. It's been pretty smooth so far. And Pastor Steve has really helped make it smooth by just our slow transitioning, which is really important if you're bringing big change. doesn't mean it's that big of change. And, and we're going to see that. I believe this ministry was really set up for this from the foundation. And so it's not changing from a foundation. It's really building on it and just expanding on it to a whole different level, you know. And so... Um, Chapter 2 was the apostolic mandate, all about being sent. Who sent you? Again, that's the key. You know, you can't operate in the apostolic if you're not sent, first of all, from the Lord. He's the sender. The Father is the sender. And he sends us. And we're all really sent because we all are from him. And even though I've never left America, well, your, your kingdom is of heaven. You're of a heavenly kingdom. Even this kingdom here on, called USA, you're an ambassador here. Technically, yeah, you're an American, but you're an ambassador. You're really a heaven citizen. You're a citizen of heaven. So you're really just an ambassador in this nation. You're basically an alien. So we cannot be nationalistic because we're not of, we are to honor this nation and be thankful for the nation that God sent us in and do everything we can to help this nation be the best nation it can be. But our goal is to bring heaven into this nation. (laughs) 
And no matter how democracy may be one of the better governments of this world, probably the best government of this world, it is, cannot compare with the kingdom of heaven. And so we, this nation, like every nation, needs the kingdom of heaven and needs kingdom people. So who sent you the Lord? Our uh, three, did anybody do this this week? Get up and remind yourself that your purpose as you arise and go forth is to invade, occupy, and transform. (laughs) Was there any difference about your day in any way or a different outlook, different... Yeah, I think you shared a little bit with me, too. <laughs> yeah, sure. Want to share anything? Go for it. Go for it. I think I, uh, so the part that I really took to my spirit was to ask the Lord every day for a word for someone. And that caused me to, like, that caused me to, <laughs> to get up. And sometimes I was, I was telling Josh, I get in my prayer spot, and I get really cozy, and I don't feel like getting up. I don't feel like going to work. I don't feel like go out into the world. But then I remembered, like Josh saying that and what we read, and I thought, okay, but maybe, maybe it's not about me. Surprise. Maybe God needs me to go give somebody a word. So I got up with that attitude, and um, the word that I shared wasn't really that monumental. I just was sharing with my Spanish class about what some of the things we did in the Dominican Republic on the mission trip. And this young woman in the class who's really been very difficult. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to love her, like the Lord loves her, you know, but very, very difficult student. And all of a sudden she got to me and she just poured her heart out. I'm just so glad to hear that Christians are behaving in such a way because I went to a Christian school and it was not loving, it was not this, it closed down, there was all kinds of bad stuff. So anyway, I just, I, I told Josh, it's not like miracle signs and wonders, I didn't, you know, but still, it was a shift in my attitude to get up and face the day, like, God, what do you, okay, I don't feel like getting up right now, but, you know, what do you need from me? How can I be of service? That's nothing new, but. But I, that, I um, <laughs> that third word there, transform, yeah. you got to have a seed before something can grow and be transformed, so that seed was planted. Because a different outlook, her outlook towards Christians because of her experience was yeah. very negative, and now she heard something positive. So now there's a you know there's light coming on. <laughs> so yeah, so that's I, you know again keep keep doing that. Have a different outlook. Be excited about going in the world. Yeah. You know it's great to have our alone time and and you know feel the presence of God just fill us and just you know touch us and make us feel good and that's great but we want to give it out you know I don't know about you but when I'm often in a service and I really feel the power of the Holy Spirit upon me sometimes and then I've been sometimes in services where it just keeps going and I, I like want to do something with it oh you know I don't want to just sit on it I mean I don't want to just okay we praise now we've worshiped okay it's lo- long enough let's let's go and and exercise what we've received and, and look at an opportunity to get out of the church building and take it with us. You know, I don't, I don't like to just be in church buildings forever. You know, we get filled up and then go out. You know, once you got it, go. <laughs> you know, I don't mind if I felt like I got it, just get up. If maybe service is half over. And just, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But if I, yeah, if, you're, if I do that to somebody else, then, uh, you know, you reap what you sow. <laughs> but anyway, uh, sending, we learned all about sending. Okay, you can went, but it's different to be sent. If you went without being sent, you don't have his authority. If you don't have his authority, you don't have his power. Some people have, you know, I mean, all believers have gifts. And so you can exercise those gifts and you can see some level of results, but it doesn't mean you were sent. So that's why we can look up at somebody, wow, look how gifted they are, but they can be living a totally different life off the pulpit. And um, there's not, you know, you can bring healing and deliverance to somebody. I don't believe without being the authority of Christ can you transform a life. 
can what comes, what's coming out of you transform somebody. You need the person of Christ. So there's a difference. You can operate in the gifts and still not be walking with God. And we see that in the Bible. For, we see that in um, Matthew chapter 7 when, he's, you know, when Jesus says, you know, you work of iniquity. But you say, it says there they did these miracles. They did signs. They did healings. They did all that. But I did not know you. So it's possible to be by used by, you know, the gifts in you, by the faith of other people, can draw that gift out too. And you, and you can release healing and deliverance and still not be walking with God. It comes without repentance, the gifts. Yeah, we, that's why it says, you know, we need to discern. We all got to be able to discern what is of the Lord or what's not. You know, it doesn't mean it's even of, of the devil. The devil does use people. We see the warnings that in, in the latter days, you know, the devil will use signs and wonders. But, um, you know, we, again, you know somebody by their fruit. You know if they're walking with God. It doesn't mean that they're, they're just, some people just get stuck in sin. But you'll know them by their fruit. If you don't see the character of Christ in somebody's life, then you know, oh, wow, they got some power, but they don't have the character. They're not really walking with God. And so we shouldn't walk with somebody who's not walking with God. Unless God's called us to help them come back to God. To lead them into repentance. To say, I can see you're not walking with God. You got, you're full of anger. You know, you got a lot of anxiety. You know, whatever it is that you see on them. Yeah, and I, I, I don't believe you'll see a lot of transformed lives. Again, it's lives that get touched, get healed and delivered, but you need the person of Christ walking with you. Only he can transform a life. You know, so I think that's the big difference. Huh. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I don't... The family are more to prove. They want to be. You got to prove yourself to your family, and they'll be the ones that test you. <laughs> you know, see if you're the same old person that you used to be. Oh, you're going to church now. Okay, you know, you're acting like a holy roller. You're in your Bible. You're in your, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But consistency over time will have an effect. Um, but sometimes some people can't see us past our past. Amen. You know, may, some people can't see us past our past. Some family members just won't even go there. Sometimes they don't want to go there. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's their They've, yeah they just chosen. I'm going to di- continue to identify you by your past. Yeah. Because if you can change, that means I can change, but I don't want to admit that. <laughs>
And there might be, you know, Jesus wasn't welcome to Nazareth, his hometown. Yeah. You know, he didn't take much time there. And we see in the apostles, they, um, God told them clearly from the get-go, your calling is not just to Jerusalem, but if some time had gone by and they still were focusing just on Jerusalem, so he had to send them out the tough way. Okay, you're not, gonna, you're not listening. <laughs> you don't remember what I told you. So I'm going to send persecution your way. I'm going to allow it to happen. And then the dispersion is what got them to go. And um, so, we, you know, we've got to be willing to go wherever God sends us. And I think we have to, I have had the experience, like, talk about my work at Stockton, where there was a young woman in my class for the whole year. And I just got, like, no connection. I tried to connect with everybody, and there was no connection. And one day I said to the Lord, so what's the deal? What am I doing wrong? I just didn't make any connection with her. And clear as anything, God said to me, she is not your assignment. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and that freaked me. It made me a little sad because I thought, okay, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to do. But um, sometimes we have to be ready to hear that and not waste time on somebody that's really yeah. either not with me or maybe never yeah. is going to come. We've got to stop trying so hard. Yeah. 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 And just let the Lord do what he does. You know, follow his leading. But are we really following his leading? Or are we just kind of moving with our emotions? Are we kind of just feeling obligated? You know, why are we, why are we trying to reach the people we're reaching? Did really the Lord send us to them? And of course, we desire to reach our family to the best that we can. But again, only God can do it. So we've got to kind of put that pressure on us. And he can do it. Let's try to get into chapter 3. You want to add one? Yeah, we just got to remember, you know, me, you always hope to see results. We're a result-oriented society. You preach a word, you want everybody to be up the altar crying and, and weeping and getting saved and healed and delivered, and it just doesn't, it's not going to happen unless God does it, no matter how much, you know, and then I found times when I seem to stumble over words the most, and then I hear more people get impacted, you know, so you just, it's all God, and he'll remind us. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Until the uh, Holy Spirit spoke to me through a sister over here, saying, What kind of love do you have for your child that she would write it out in the will? But it's just the kind of love I have for you, says the Lord. You know? Yeah. Hallelujah. Right between mm -hmm. the eyes. Okay? <laughs> so I repented right then and there, thanked my sister, got on my face, mm -hmm. and thanked God because how effective would I have been in this mess today? Mm hmm. <laughs> Amen. 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 And a lot of things that we remember is we're fighting against principalities mm -hmm. and high places, even when we live with my family, mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's hated me for no reason at all. It's like the older she 
got the work she got, but then God showed me Esau's spirit, Cain and Abel's spirit. He showed me that she was jealous. Because she takes it out of her mouth. I said, oh, man, now I know what I'm dealing with. But my son said something. He's a mighty man of God. And he said, Mom, because I was going to take her to court because I got caught. She was harassing me. I mean, she was, that spirit was relentless. The thing she said to me, well, I can't even repeat. But I said, I, I said, I had enough. I'm saving these messages. I tried to block her. I don't know how she's still getting through my phone. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm saving it. I'm, I'm taking you to court. And she lives in Trenton. And then my son said something. He's a child. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, Mom, he said, you can't fight this in the natural. He said, you have to fight this in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and looked at him and said, what's up? You know, so then, <laughs> while I was on, while I was on my 21-day uh, fast, I kept on calling out her name to the Lord. I kept on saying, I speak peace over your life. I said, I speak peace in your life. I said, and I speak deliverance in the name of Jesus. And I said, you fast spirit to go to the right place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I kept on speaking, and by the third day, mm -hmm. I met my phone. There was a message on my phone. Uh, Sandra, I just wanted to let you know I love you so much. Mm -hmm. See, because I love you in the spirit. Yeah. And I just yeah. kept on speaking to me and just said, mm -hmm. and she said, I wanted to know that I said, and my heart just, I felt so good. And I said, I said, I love you too. I said, our heart. And so she didn't get my message, but I was able to get her. And so the Lord uh, prompted my spirit, call your sister, call. I said, I hope she got my message. I called her. She never got my message saying that I love her. But I was able to speak to her. And she said, did you get my message? I said, yes. I said, you should not. She said, no. I said, well, I said, I love you too. We stayed on the phone for 45 minutes to an hour. We never did that in two years. Mm -hmm. And without her cussing me, I slammed the phone down. Mm -hmm. and don't say Jesus. Oh, you know. <laughs> so but that was God. You know, so mm -hmm. we're fighting against the principalities. We're fighting against the family and against us. You know, we're trying to show love. And they're con the enemy is constantly using them. You gotta step back and just pray. Because mm -hmm. they know you better, they know what buttons to push, they know your good, they know your bad. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna use that things gonna happen using that to, you know. So we gotta take the higher ground. Always take the higher ground oh, approach. I yeah. I was okay. I was glad it got you. Yeah. <laughs> so when the you know the battle seems overwhelming. Just always ask yourself, am I at the higher ground? Am I, am I fighting this natural or am I taking this into the spiritual? Yeah. Spiritual is the higher ground. And then, you know, it's not even just screaming out to God and throwing, word, you know, our prayers up to Him, our frustration to Him. That can be all part of it, but most importantly, it's listening, getting that word again. And then that word released right. does the work, <laughs> you know. So that's... So we're going to try to get chapter 3 done before our break. It's a long chapter. <laughs> it's a lot in it. I was, I was underlining everything in it. <laughs> so we'll see what, what Holy Spirit does. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff in this. But um, the church, and, so y'all, like some of y'all went ahead. Wow, good. Okay, the church in Jerusalem. We're first looking at that church. Okay, the motto of that church is definitely Acts 2, 41 through 47. And if, you know, people think church is so complicated. And again, we are the church, but, you know, when we come together, what should we do? <laughs> what should we do when we come together? Well, it's pretty much laid out in just six verses here. And those six verses are it. You just go on that. That's good. Don't add anything. <laughs> Don't take anything out of that, away from that. You know, and that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Yeah. You know, going forth, they, they gave everything that they had as each person had need. They um, met at the uh, temple daily, and then they also went out and met house to house. <clears throat> so they were fellowshipping together in a building, also going house to house, having small meetings. And they were ministering out daily, and people were being added to the church every single day. So how, oh, let's learn about church growth. Let's go to the next conference about church growth and tell here. All you need to hear is Acts 2, 41 through 47. That, that's it. Towards the end of, um, okay, a lot of this is his particular journey. Every ministry is going to have their own journey. 
if they're called to become an apostolic center. Um, as you see, the second year of their... He really took three years to really bring forth this apostolic center concept to the entire church. The uh, first year we see that he focused a lot on understanding the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is near. What does it mean, the kingdom of heaven here, on earth, as it is in heaven? What does that really look like? That was his focus. The best way to do with anything is just teach scripture. <laughs> if you're doing any kind of shift in anything, it needs to be lined up in scripture. And if, if you can teach it clearly through scripture, you know, often it will be received. You know, if you just throw a bunch of words out there without backing it up with scripture... You know, apostolic, well, apostolic's all in the scriptures, but if you just throw that word out there without the scriptures to back it, just like, what is that? Um, the second year, it was all about the book of Acts. Last year, here at Praise Tabernacle, this was brought forth in April, I believe. We started sharing this with the elders. We had a retreat in November to kind of with Dr. Leon to kind of full, uh, establish even more amongst leaders. Going into the 40th um, anniversary, we began to release it to the church as a whole. I started teaching from Exodus, the beginning of last year, and into uh, the book of Joshua. Um, those two books, you see them coming out of Egypt and going through the process of transformation in the wilderness. And then in Joshua, you see the Old Covenant book of Acts, which was all about taking land. There, the focus is more natural. Book of Acts is all about the spiritual taking of the land. The book of Joshua is all about the natural. And so um, all of that has a purpose. So every book that we're teaching, every message that I, that I bring forth has a purpose of taking our church somewhere. And so that's why I'm, you know, so passionately trying to get the leaders to get it, because I say, if you miss it, if you're not hearing it, you don't know where we're going. Even all the elders, I'm sharing all the, these um, teachings from Apostolic Center, even from the role of the apostle to them from our recording so that they can receive it and get it and share with all of our leaders so that we can um, really know where God has taken us. And again, it's not where I am taking you, it's where the Lord has taken us. And I'm just doing my part. And so this year, 2019, the focus would be the book of Acts, just like they did there. I'm not copying that. It's just how the Holy Spirit worked in my heart and what I felt it was the time to do. And I think the book of Acts is just going to lay it all out. You know, the foundation of understanding the apostolic, understanding really how the Holy Spirit works because it's all tied together, is in the book of Acts, how the church should look like. And in doing that, also find the ways, things that we should probably get rid of. Things maybe that are not according to the way we should operate. You know, things that are not bearing fruit. So uh, Acts 13 shift. Like I said, Acts 13 is when it really begins to shift into an apostolic center. That's when Paul now had become, come on the scene You know, it was amazing, um, I didn't hit that this Sunday, but when Stephen was being stoned to death, and Stephen being a Greek Jew, and um, all these uh, new leaders, these deacons were all Greek Jews, and one was a proselyte Jew, that means they were of some other culture, and had converted to becoming a Jew. Um, now these were the appointed ones, and now as things heat up, they martyred Stephen, and now there's going to be a greater wave of persecution. And now all the, the especially, the, most of the Hebrew apostles stay in Jerusalem. They don't yet follow Acts 1.8. It's really the Hellenistic deacons <laughs> that really take it out, and all the people, especially those of a Hellenistic background, because they probably had connections in other places as well, because they had come from other lands to Jerusalem. Now, they're the ones that are having most heat on them, and they're running for their lives. But as they're doing, though, you see they're preaching the gospel everywhere of the kingdom with signs, wonders, and miracles. And the church begins to spread into Samaria. And then Saul was also there when Stephen was being stoned. Probably seeing Stephen's reaction, began to 
have a work in his heart that he probably was fighting within, even though he was persecuting Christians and killing them. I bet he, he was so angry because there was this fight inside of him. And so then later, he's now the one that brings it everywhere else, all over the world. So my point to that is um, he was the, one of the, the, the apostle, really, that was much involved with Antioch, and that was really his sending base. So, um, grand restoration process, Acts 3.21, says that Jesus is seated in heaven until the restoration of all things. That's where really the emphasis of the Apostolic Center is to see everything restored to what God intended it to be. It's all about transformation. Transformation of everything. So most typical churches, it's about ministering to the people that come to that congregation, the, the members of that particular congregation. It's about all about the pastor and the, the small team ministering to them. But in Apostolic Center, it's all about transforming everything. So it's a much more. <laughs> it's, it's, um, again, if you want the easy road and you want us to go to, to nursery and stay in nur this nursery for the rest of your life, you go to a typical local church that's just maintaining everything and not really expanding and growing. And you can expect your, you know, to get your d diaper changed and, <laughs> and, you know, and baba. Give, give it a baba. And <laughs> you know? <laughs> How about I'll read it because I underlined all of that. <laughs> yeah. We could also mention the restoration of the Word of God in the hands of the people in the 14th century, the restoration of the truth. Again, all these things were always there, it's just it's like they were ignored. Always in the Bible. Weren't the people then following the Bible? Not necessarily so. And remember, under Catholicism, not, the common man didn't have a Bible. It was just a few people. It was written in Latin. So it was only of, during the Restoration that when the Scripture started being released for everyone, that's when Restoration started to be happening because then people started reading it. You know, oh, all right, this is nothing like what it's in here. And so we're on this long process, you know, out of the Dark Ages to where we're at today of restoring truth. And understand, you know, God knows how stubborn we are and how it's a slow process, how it just is one little bit at a time. Centuries, you know, you'll see one main truth emphasized. But if you really see restoration now, since 1900, since the uh, outpouring of the Spirit at Azusa, Azusa Street, there's been a real um, acceleration of restoration of the offices and... and so, um, the salvation by faith in the 16th century, the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the turn of the 20th century. Within the last hundred years or so, the restoration of, among other things, the ministry of healing, the office of the prophet, and the office of the apostle. So, the prophet began to be emphasized in the 80s, the apostle in the 90s. The kingdom of God became the message, really, from the 2000 to 2010, though, again, in certain places, that's not even being taught yet, but... Those who really move as the Holy Spirit leads, those who pray and seek God for a message, <laughs> usually are in tune with what God is doing throughout the earth. And now we're in the time of the fullness of times. You know, it's, it's the focus of being the army of God and, and, and walking in all. Every denomination had a truth. Let's, let's bring them all together and walk in God's full power. Restoring apostolic Christianity, it's all about moving forward, which in turn brought us to change our governing. Okay, okay. here's the seven, one of the questions to one of the answers of the last part of it, the seven, um, seven dynamics, I guess you'd say, of an apostolic center. First of all, there's an initial apostolic base. A home base, a place where you start. Again, well, you know, people have asked me, hey, are you ever going to leave and go somewhere else? I really believe God called me here to establish, to be part of a base. This is the base. So it doesn't mean I don't believe I'm leaving. 
I might be going <laughs> some places, but I'm not leaving. This is the base. The Holy Spirit is in charge. Is that key? <laughs> These are, you know, should be basic truth. Chose, there's usually a chosen man, but again, that chosen man is all about raising up other men and women. And it could be a chosen woman as well. So Paul was the chosen man of that time, but an apostle is always, again, the, is the foundation. He's always about lifting everyone else up. So he's just the chosen person for a period. And like the great Miles Moreau said, you know, our job is to work ourselves out of a job. So get to the point where we're not needed anymore. Because that's what a parent should do. A parent should want their kids to not need them anymore. Not need them because they just want to be independent, but not need them because they've matured so well, there's nothing that you have to offer them anymore except love and support. You know, so that should be the goal of every church leader as well, is not, you know, just to have a people that need them so much. And, and when you're an insecure leader, you feel your worth from being needed. So if somebody is just in an office because they got a degree, at, you know, they went through Bible school, they, uh, you know, they're a son of a pastor, so now they're the pastor. <laughs> Whatever it is, if you, know, if, if you didn't get raised up by the Holy Spirit and matured and be released by the Holy Spirit into that position, then you're going to often have insecurities. And how many of us have experienced insecure leaders before? <laughs> yeah, so I don't want to be an insecure leader. Probably have been an insecure leader because I started leadership at 24. So I was only saved for t three years at that point. Huh? You were a Timothy. Yeah, very young leader. But I probably had some insecurities to work through, and hopefully I didn't hurt people along the way while I was an insecure person. Uh, thank you. Well, work of the Lord. I thank God for him. Thank you, thank you. Apostolic teams is the thing that develops then. We're going to go more in depth than that. In this chapter, or the chapter ahead, um, apostolic churches and then apostolic centers, apostolic networks. So what's the distinction between all that? We're going to find out as we move forward. Two types of government I thought was really important. I underlined this. The traditional picture we have today, this is page 51, for the government of the local church is either a board of elders or deacons, or both, leading the congregation and having authority over the pastor, or it is a senior pastor functioning as the main leader of the congregation, balanced by a board of elders, that ensures he is not using his authority incorrectly. So as I really look at our own church government, this body's government, Praise Tabernacle, we have more of the second, but the congregation does also get to vote as well. So there's a little bit of the first and second, but more leaning towards the second. The elders really trust the pastors, Pastor Steve and myself. There's, you know, but they're there to balance us and to make sure that we don't, you know, go off <laughs> in some, you know, yeah. So they're there to help us um, stay focused on the Lord, you know, to call us out if need be. But as we're moving into this apostolic center now, the idea of the elders is going to deepen to much more more. They're going to be much more involved in the body. Um, what factors determine whether the elders would be appointed at the beginning or later? Okay, elders, overseers, pastors. Let's first return to Paul. This is page 52 on the bottom. Last visit to Ephesus in Acts 2017, Paul asked for the elders of the church, and when they arrived, he called them overseers and told them they had been chosen to shepherd the church, so a proper biblical function of an elder is to be an overseer. And that's really what we're moving forward in, is where the elders are really given much more of a green light, not that they weren't overseeing different departments, but we're not just saying just pray for them or just kind of be there, but to be intricately connected to the department heads, to the leaders, to meeting with them regularly, to knowing what's going on, to sharing vision with them, to making sure that they're moving, you know, with the Holy Spirit, moving under the vision of the church. Um, so they're more of a shepherd 
So my role is now more pastoring. My pastoral role as an apostle is to pastor leaders and more shepherd or oversee the elders. And the elders are to oversee the department heads. The department heads are to oversee the volunteers. And the volunteers are to oversee the other volunteers, you know, <laughs> who are submitted to one another. But it's, and it's not a pyramid scheme <laughs> at all. How many of you have had enough of pyramid schemes? <laughs> um, it's more of a support system. It's more that way rather than that way. There's not one above the other. It's just supporting one another, coming alongside. Yeah, alignment, being aligned to each other. Yep. Yep, broader base. So we're just broadening the base. I like that. That's the, the transition we're doing. Very good. <laughs> what did the mandate of the elders to shepherd the church involve? Mainly three things. Steward the work that has been established. Feed the flock. And that's, a, you know, that's another part of it. The elders actually feeding the flock. Feeding the departments that they oversee. De feeding the department heads. You know, really pouring into them. You know, making sure everyone is accountable to somebody and everyone is receiving something. Often leaders do a lot of leading and don't get poured into. So they burn out. So on a Sunday, a lot, often a lot of leaders aren't inside being fed because they're working. <laughs> they're helping. They're doing, they're, the kids' church is going on. There's deacons, elders. Yeah, they're some, somewhat in the Word, but they're focused on what they have to do, what they have to oversee, so they don't always get that. So... My responsibility is to make sure that elders are getting fed. The elders are responsible to make sure the department heads are getting fed so that everyone is getting fed. Everyone's being built up. Everyone's growing. Yep. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's just wisdom. It doesn't happen. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. But you, sh you know, you would think it would not be about yourself as a leader that you would want whatever's best for the team, <laughs> for your people. What will help them the most is that they all are growing, is, and that I widen my team as much, get as many coaches as possible, mm -hmm. as needed, so that everyone is getting what they need to really grow and develop. One man can't do it all. Two people can't do it. Three, you know, depending on how large. A group of people is is how many leaders you need, and again we see that with Jethro. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and, 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 you know, this way everybody helps everybody. You know, they can speak up into your life as well as down into the other people's lives, and they're all working to bring each other up. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it should, you know, it's the work of God in our hearts. That's how we should be as leaders. We should, that should be part of the qualification of being a leader. Humble, is team oriented, is thinking about others more than themselves. That should just be common, but we all know it's not what we see often in most. A lot of churches are going to have people that come from other churches that were hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's wise too. If somebody comes and they, hey, they did a lot in another church, so hey, let's get them right away involved. But they're probably hurting from whatever they experience. First of all, you got to find out, did you get right, you know, with the situation? Is that resolved? You're not carrying something that you can't get over because you can't get over until you resolve it. And then, now that you're here, let's wait till God's timing to get, Amen. you know. Yeah. We're going to come to a time soon, I believe, as a church that, yeah, other people will come here, but there's going to be a lot of new converts, people who don't know the Lord. It'd be so refreshing to see. It's great when, you know, people come from different places and, they, you know, from other churches and all, but 
more importantly, you know, brand new babies. We can just raise up from the beginning who's not coming with a bunch of hurt to get healed from. You know, they have hurts from the world, yeah, but it's a different issue, different way, different approach. Mm-hmm. And I had a dream where, you know, the, the harvest is mm-hmm. ready to get mm-hmm. took. <laughs> yep. But what are we going to do with them? Mm-hmm. And hurt people hurt people. Yep. So those things have to be addressed. And I'm going to be really rude, but, you know, we have to stop prostituting people. They come from places hurt. We need workers. Oh, just put them there, put them there. You know, leadership has to be more discerning and say, mm-hmm. absolutely, we want to serve. We yeah. want you to serve. But, you know, let's go through this process first. Mm-hmm. Right. Because if not, we just keep doing the same thing over and over. And, and there's no success in that. Yep. And since we haven't had such a structure previously, we may have people in, play, in positions, places that are hurting. And now the possibility of them of it being recognized now is there because you have elders overseeing, you know. Um, so at the same time, we have to be willing now to say, hey, it's time for you to take a step back for a bit. Yeah. Not, you know, just to see you healed so that you can serve more effectively. And you know, Josh, I think mm-hmm. going yeah. forward, that's probably something that, you know, leadership has to be trained about because, you know, even not being, you know, from praise per se. You know, you get to experience people in their raw forms <laughs> because you ain't from here, this is our house. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the truth of the matter is that if you're treating me like that or treating anybody like that mm-hmm. because you're not from here, what are we doing to those guests that are coming? I see in a lot of faces, I'm not even from here and I see a lot of new faces. Yes. Are you guys seeing new faces? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, and it's this, important that when you see new faces, yes, exactly. you make it your point. That yeah. should be our, like, no, I'm not no, from no. here. If I see somebody I don't know, yeah. that's my objective. It's not social time, y'all. Yeah. Social time we do on a personal time. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you have to look around. Who don't I know? Because those hurting people, I remember when I first went to a church after coming from somewhere hurt. I remember saying, oh, I don't like these people. (laughs) (laughs) But the word was right. And when, you know, I got to a point of healing, you know, I said to the leader, your people are whack. (laughs) If it wasn't because of what Mm -hmm. you were ministering, I would have left. So how many people that didn't know that that word was on fire left? Mm -hmm. And they're lost somewhere. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's a lot of leaders. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that it's loud enough, sis. <laughs> There's a lot of leaders that need healing. Mm-hmm. You know, that have been here. There's people here that have said to me, you know, I've been in this church since it started, since it started and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> what is Jesus doing? That's all I would like to know. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. You know, so it's important because what's going on here is too important. It's, mm. The work is just too important. Yep. And we have to deal with every area, even the ones that are uncomfortable. Yep. Apostle. Yep. <laughs> well, I got to do our part. I'm telling you. I'm trying to do mine. <laughs> and walk in that door. Mm -hmm. And that's what I look for when I go to a church. Mm -hmm. I have to feel the love about it. If you have a rock, if you have a bad day, don't stand at that door and beat somebody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Because they come back. Forth in power that was coming forth. Because I can't get under everything. I'm sorry. 
you know. But that was really the love and then the word that was being taught. And then people was greeting you, and um, that meant a whole lot to me. And um, <coughs> this is a place that uh, I know God is here. Amen. 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 And so, to go on with what my sister said, there has to be a, a, and when I was looking at these three words, I was kind of taking it personally, mm. because I had to allow Jesus to invade me, to occupy mm. me, and mm. transform me before I can walk into that fullness. And you're so right. You know, sure. There are so many people who are in positions they're causing more damage than good. Right. And, and it's, you know, when you, 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 you're going to have to get to a place of maturity. I had a conversation with someone who had been in ministry a long time. And it, and it still was such a focus on what I need, what I need, what I need, what I need. But there has to be a shift that happens in these centers that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Where the leadership is no longer about your need when you come. And I agree with you, it's not. Of course, yes, fellowship and stuff is important for us as leaders, but when you come in, you have a job to do, mm -hmm. and your focus really has to, it really has to be a paradigm shift in your focus mm -hmm. of changing from what, what is, what I need, what, and where you have to get, I, and I went through a season of that, where there was times that I, I knew I needed transforming, and they, that's why I've been friends with Josh, because we were by friends with him right in that sanctuary over there. Um, your prayer teams and stuff like that. But I had, I had, and it was just something clicked in me that said, I got to go out and get what I need. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can't lead people astray. Mm -hmm. I've watched some very crazy demonic things happen at altars where there's trans, transferring things mm -hmm. that have happened. And when people go down and left with more than what they came down there for, it, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But I agree with what you said. There has to be. This, this process has to take first in you before you're able to walk in this. Yeah. Because if you haven't allowed the Lord to invade you, occupy, and transform you, oh, yeah. then you you're can't not, walk well, in what you're He's not going to send you. He's not, you're not going to get sent. Or you send yourself. There's no authority. He went. But you know, that's just something to I mean, say that every day. Lord, invade me. You know, occupy every space of my life. Transform me. Jeff shared and Liz, and then we're going to take a break. They're, oh, they want to take a break. So, Jeff, you'll start off when we get back, and we'll try to finish everything tonight. But uh, have a. Jeff is going to share something, and then we're going to kind of 
fly through what we got to and try to hit the most important stuff, even though I underlined everything. But I will have wisdom how to go about this. But anyway, Jeff? Yeah, and that reminds me of like, um, remember Pastor Roger was sharing yesterday for those who were here about Julie, Pastor Steve's daughter, asking him a um, question about, do you need to pray about everything all the time? And then I saw Julie after church too, and I started, she asked me a question similar regarding, um, you know, how's your prayer life? What's God been speaking to you? And, and so I share with her that you know, there was a season of time where it was all about, you know, what God said recently or my encounter or my experience. It says, as I've grown and matured, it's a constant. And so it's not so much, like, I can't, like, identify exactly what was, it's just he's constantly speaking. And it's not a work anymore. It's not, man, you know, in my hour prayer time this morning, you know, it's more of a continual, not that I won't have some prayer times and not have my devotions and all that, but it's, I used to have to have them, and now I, I just, I walk in it more. And so that, sometimes it's hard to understand that, but it's just a maturity. It's like when you're, you know, in a marriage, you have to learn each other at first, and so you have to figure each other out. You have to try hard often to please your spouse because you're just learning what they like. And it might be so foreign to you that you have to really think hard, <laughs> work hard to please them. But as you know them and, and you become one, the hidden mystery of oneness, you just know and you do it without thinking. And that's what the, your spouse, especially female, <laughs> usually loves more than anything when a male does something without trying. Absolutely. And they just help them. <laughs> they just do what they do. And that's just support towards them, you know, and just love. And same thing with God. We just get to that place. So I'm going to just fly through this. Um, not that we're going to miss anything. I think we're just going to go, well, let me hit that part. I thought that was important. Top of 53. Nowhere do we see elders or pastors either planning new churches or leading existing churches into major developments. This mandate belonged to apostles working with apostolic teams. Again, we're going by... The Bible, how things happened in the beginning, of the birth of the church. Pastors are appointed to steward, care, and protect. Apostles, again, are sent to invade, occupy, and transform. Two distinct roles. And the body of Christ needs both. So since the focus has just been primarily over 
the centuries, <laughs> the last couple of centuries, pastors, then mainly the church has just been receiving stewardship, care, and protection. And when that takes place, then Hollywood can do what it wants. The homosexual movement can develop as it is, has. Because <clears throat> we haven't invaded, we haven't occupied, we haven't transformed. You know, all we've been able to do is try to care for the sheep real well. And so we've let everything else go to hell, basically. And now we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> so 2,000 years after Jesus died, 2,000 plus years, and have we really even started regarding restoration? <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is the key, you know, what's our mission statement here? People restored, inspired, serving everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, I, I hope to get to the serving everywhere, but reality is that we can't do much restoration out there if we're still dealing with restoration in here. And why is there so much still need for restoration if the focus has so long been caring? Why haven't we cared? You know, haven't we been at least caring for people well? Well, this is what it is. It's like, how many of you, anybody ever gone to a small school? Like you grew up in a small school. Like me, in my little town, you know, we graduated 28 members. 28 students graduated. Small. That was the biggest class that graduated in the school ever. Often in small school, you get so close and so tight, and you never want to grow up. You just kind of want to stay and relive the good, the, the good old years, high school years. And so you'll have some, you know, you go to the reunion 20 years later, and they're still doing the same things they did 20 years ago. They're still playing around, fooling around. The problem is now they're married and now they have children, but they're behaving like they were 16, 17, and 18. And so you're still a kid, but you're a grown-up because you have to be, because you're responsible, because you now you, but you can't hold a job. You can't hold a spouse. You can't raise your kids right. So you're messed up. So at church who has only been cared for and stewarded without learning how to grow up, mature, how to occupy, how to have an occupation, do something beyond just that's what happens. You just get, you know, you just get, when you've been a kid for too long, you know, you just get involved in a bunch of childish stuff. And so the restoration's needed <laughs> to get you back to a place to even realize, okay, it's time for me to grow up. So that just <laughs> came to my mind at that moment, but yeah, yeah, it's like you're just not ready for it, and yet you have to do it. Let's go all the way to the last part here, page 57. Again, read it, because there's a lot of important stuff in there, but we're running out of time. Facts of apostolic centers. Number one, do we believe in the church? Absolutely. It's all about the church. It's just maturing the church. I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not, will not overcome it. So, you know, to be an overcomer, you've got to mature. It's raising up overcomers. Why do we use the term apostolic center? First, I want to clarify that an apostolic center is a church. For those who are part of an apostolic center, it is their local church. The term apostolic center is useful to identify a type of church. Whereas when we use the traditional term local church, the image that immediately comes to mind is of a pastoral church. Let me just look over some of these highlighted big words are important. 
That's why they highlighted them. The focus in apostolic centers is on training people to do the ministry rather than on ministering to them. So that becomes the focus. So automatic, people who want to remain kids probably will have to go elsewhere. Because nobody really, if you don't want to grow up, you don't like being challenged all the time. Some kids are like that. And so, you ever had a kid like that who just didn't want to grow up? But they didn't want to tell you, they didn't want you to tell them what to do? <laughs> you <know>? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with them? <laughs> Often they just, they go out. They, even though they're not ready for it, they can't handle because they don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to be held, you know, they don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to be, they don't want their mess to be spotted all the time. So they just go out and make a mess somewhere else. So uh, I understand that with an apostolic center is the emphasis becomes being challenged, being charged to develop, to grow, to go forward, to advance. It's going to be hard for some. You know, meaning some people like to remain where they're at. That's just the nature. Again, our human nature is to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. We like to remain comfortable. To me, it's not very comfortable to, to remain, a, you know, a child. <laughs> but for others, it is. <laughs> Did you mean three? Not yet. Number three, why not simply say an apostolic church instead of an apostolic center? The church is apostolic by nature. The term apostolic center is useful to identify a particular type of church that's directly led by an apostle. The term apostolic church can be applied to the healthy pastoral church model. Did we get it? No? <laughs> Why not simply say an apostolic church instead of an apostolic center? Okay, you can have an apostolic church that it's usually led by an apostle. Um, apostolic center, again, becomes where you now, it develops into where it's a resource for many churches. So just like a denomination you say, you know, has multiple churches under the like uh, Walter Nistorinko, Pastor Walter, who was here last week, he's the presbyter for the South Southern District of New Jersey Assemblies of God. So he oversees 25 churches in this area. So that's, um, you know, but an apostolic center, different than denomination, as you see. Now, not, maybe to some denominations operate probably with what, how Walter is growing in this understanding of apostolic he is probably being much more relational than the typical denomination that is all structure without relationship. So their alignment with other churches isn't very relational. It's just we come in if there's a problem and we get you out if we need to and bring somebody else in. That's more of the typical denomination. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah, they just deal with fires. Will apostolic centers replace local churches? Local church is the traditional term we use for a more pastoral type of church. Some of these traditional local churches will go through a transformation to become apostolic centers, but certainly not all of them. Both type of churches are necessary. One doesn't take the place of the other. It's very important. One doesn't take the place of the other. Both type of churches are necessary. No more than apostles can replace pastors. Again, Jesus is all five, and if you want Jesus, you need all five. But you can't have all of Jesus with only some. All are needed to experience all of Jesus. Is the apostolic center superior to the local church? It's in a spirit of humility and service that the diverse parts of the body, oh, we're an apostolic center. Yeah. It's not about pride and ego, about anything. And we're nothing without Holy Spirit. The only way you can be filled with the Holy Spirit is through being humility. Because if you're not, if you're filled with yourself, you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. There's a problem going on. So this should be, you know, it's not something to be just bragging about, and it's just serving. It's just our call to serve. You just have a. What's our role to serve? It's, it's not a work of the flesh. It's a work of the Spirit. It's just what God is doing. Why does he choose here? Why not over there? Who knows? It's only God knows. He has to choose somewhere. Why did God choose Israel? Why did he choose Jerusalem? You know, he did. He had to choose some place, some people to work through. So we're just, we're, well, we're chosen. Everyone's chosen. <laughs> Every church is chosen. I think with, this, with, with ministry, the old type of ministry, um, it's very difficult to have a 
recognize the gifts in others if you don't particularly have that gift developed in yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's they people say, oh, you, that can't be true. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't we don't do that. You yeah. know, kind yeah. of thing. And if you had that developed in yourself, you would recognize it in others. So that shows it shows all mm-hmm. the lack mm-hmm. in, in in that. And that's why every leader needs to be connected to apostolic centers, because then they, what the goal is, is because an apostolic center should have a five-fold ministry team, and therefore the members of another church, and especially the leaders of that other church, can come to a setting like this, a Bible school, and receive from five-fold gifts, mm-hmm. can have more than just what they're getting, but it doesn't mean they have to leave where they're at, they just bring more with them so they can serve there at a greater maturity, you know, on a greater level. So this is like, this, this is a big part of an apostolic center. And this is why, you know, I think it's in the next part, but we'll just go into that a little bit now. You know, the foundation of when you're going through the transition, you don't want to, you want to keep the foundation that is of the Lord. You know, this foundation of this church 40 years ago, the founder had a passion for Bible school. That's a big part of an apostolic center, a Bible school before the region. You know, another part is missions. Call of apostolic center is all about missions. It's all about going out. It's about being sent. That's been what this church has been all about since its beginning, a missions-minded church. <laughs> so those are things you're not going to do away with. You know, those are very important things. And also, this is a gifts. This is a, a charismatic church. It was, re- it was birthed in the charismatic renewal. All about gifts. The apostolic is all a gift. It's a gift. (laughs) So it's just emphasizing another aspect of the gifts that hasn't been really emphasized. It's just building on it. So we're really just building. We're not replacing. It's just building on the foundation for such a time. Because anything healthy grows. So we're honoring our past and the foundation that's been laid. And now we're just building on it. It's been maintained for a long time now. And God is now saying, build, advance, move forward, move ahead. Amen? Yes. Mm-hmm. You should have a balance of all the gifts. Um, in different seasons, you'll have different gifts probably being focused on. Right now, you know, because of becoming this apostolic center, the gift that's in me will probably be used in service a lot in the forefront, but in times ahead, I may step back a lot and put others forward. Pastor Steve, the balance is very needed um, with the pastoral. You know, like next week, we're going to have Jonathan minister, the evangelistic. But again, there's more settings than just Sunday morning. That's a key for the whole body. But again, you got a whole variety. Some of the people are not disciples of the Lord. Some of them are just, um, you know, seat warmers. And, um, but the disciples, there's many other places. There's Monday nights. There's Wednesday nights. There's D groups. There's other places where other gifts are flowing through people. So there's a lot of opportunity to develop in all the gifts. So uh, questions and food for thought. This is what I'm going to have you all do is for your homework assignment and to get credit, all these chapters of questions, you don't have to do the typical um, three question, two page. You just have to answer these questions. But since we don't have time, I'm not going to answer them for you. (laughs) We're going to move on to chapter four for the last 25 minutes. (laughs) Yep, you answer them. I see the, question, the thing I just said, answered number seven. <laughs> yep, so some things are just being answered. So if you heard it, you'll get it. But it's, it's in there. Okay, chapter four, how to switch wine skits without, without spilling. That sounds... I'm going to try not to spill the wine. Most of the time during, during transition... A lot of wine gets spilled. Okay, basically what I was just talking about, there it is. Assess your foundation. 
And I wrote it on the side there, PBI, missions and gifts. There's no point building on a cracked foundation, and there's no gain in moving ahead of God's timing. So what does that mean? It means during transition, it should be a, a period, a long period of time of really being able to see if there is a cracked foundation. You know, you need time, and there needs to be a process. Keep what is of the Lord, and remove what is not. All right, and just knowing, you know, that any, this, like any ministry was birthed at a certain time, God's been doing new restoration. Have we added that? Have we allowed that to be um, part of who we are now? Is it part of our um, beliefs and, you know, is it, at, is it at the heart of what we do? We should be current with what God is doing throughout the earth today. We don't want to be stuck in yesteryear. Okay, we're not going back to the 90s. We're not going to go back to doing church the way it was done back then. Okay, we want to be in tune with what God is doing now. But part of how, what he did back then is still part of who we are today. It's just he's building on it. So like one thing I've heard older people that, you know, remember the, the renewal of the 90s, which was more focused on the Father's love. And so there's a lot of those who have an um, a, uh, orphan spirit. That was really the focus of the Toronto blessing. Um, and that went worldwide and affected a lot of churches. And it was just all about knowing the Father's love. And it was very personal and individual and intimate. Not that we're not going to ever have that, but that's probably not going to be the emphasis in today. You know, we're probably not going to see things like they were back then. God's doing a new work. In little bits, of course. People who, there are still people who have an orphan spirit. There's still people that need to understand the Father's love. But it's not just what the main focus is at this time. Yeah. And in inner healing sessions and times like that, those things will occur. But as a whole, it's a new work. You know, again, the emphasis is maturing. Maturing. Changing a church mindset in two years. So they went through a process, just like we're going through a process, and just like we're all going through a process, okay? Again, we're seeing maybe this as a church leadership, but each of us has a part. So all of us are going through our own individual process as we're, going part of a, as we're part of a corporate process. Yes. Are you guys keeping, like, I would say news, but, like, um, like benchmarks on, okay, we've gotten to this, and how, or how are you gauging that you're in that going forward in your process, like, so how, how do you manage that? That's a good question, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, again, or not, I don't know why I said again, this is, um, this is just the work that the Lord, a lot of it, it's what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm sharing constantly with Pastor Steve and the elders, so we're, this is, we're just beginning. Yeah, yeah we're really just beginning. So I think a lot of what we can learn through this could help us. So I'm learning. The, so um, this is helping me a lot when I'm teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. So yeah. We see it so clearly. Yeah. That's that's where you can spill, and I I could get caught easily doing that. That's encouraging to help build momentum too. Yeah. You see, okay, look, guys, look how far we came from here to here, and that that will build momentum, and, and and like, oh, wow, mm. encourage folks to continue with the vision. I think I need to read this for us because uh, this process part because there's a lot in that. But yeah, when people speak and they speak up, I know most people speak in a normal tone. But, yeah, I don't want to say I'm hard of hearing, but no, I'm kind of hard of hearing. <laughs> yeah, that nice loud voice though. You definitely hear Rich. <laughs> we must realize the people around us are not in our in our heads to see what we see at the same time we see it. 
Strong visionaries tend to focus so much on what they see that they become oblivious to the reality of the people surrounding them and to the steps needed to reach their goal. I've been, it's, been in, it's in me, my nature, without the help of the Holy Spirit, to sometimes even look past. I just focus on the people who get it. Whoever get it, let's go. <laughs> you don't get it? All right, see ya. We're gone. <laughs> you know? I'm not bringing the stuff. You said you were already in conference. And when you're a visionary, God gives you a vision, you're already there. So, one of the youth was like, We're in the practice. What about all these little steps before that? I said, Oh, wait a minute. She said, You left us behind. Wait a minute. We got to do this back here. And I'm like, Well, I'm already here. So, you are so right. You get caught up in losing particulars. That's so funny. But they were just clowning me Sunday about that. They were like, um, what about this? I was like, oh, my bad. I'm sorry. My wife helps me a lot. So she's, she's the key because she's pastoral. Yeah. So um, pastoral and apostles seem to be sometimes going that way. You know? So she helps me stay on track. I don't miss things. Catch it. So, yeah, thank God for my wife. So I try to share everything with her, even though sometimes I'm like, I don't even know if she can. There's some things I know that I'll share, then share that she's going to pull me back down, and I don't want to be pulled down. <laughs> you know? But, yeah, it's tough. tough. Um, enjoy the journey as much as the destination. And get so focused on and so excited about what we're going to become. And it might be 20 years before we become. So you're just going to be full of anxiety and just pushing and on this adrenaline rush to get there and it takes 20 years <laughs> no but so far I've had this in me 14 years ago when I first came here so <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yeah so it's been hard I've been ahead of myself many times and I've had to pull back and I've had to you know stop a lot of things I was doing yeah, which could mess up my reputation. <laughs> he, never, he never finishes anything that he starts. No. Yep, but you just got just to gotta swallow it. <laughs> yep. It's imperative to pace yourself, to gradually disclose the revelation. Gradually disclose the revelation. Talking about, you know, I didn't bring this up to the elders until last year. We want to pass on. Again, to help with what I even brought forth to the elders is what I took all the prophecies that, are, that I've received and even that our church has received. And the cool thing is when Linda came to me and told me, I got that vision in 1992. I said, whoa, that will be helpful because it's not just something I'm bringing. It's something that God, God has been speaking longer than I've been here. So I thought that was important. Visions need to be broken down into bite-sized pieces and be presented consistently one bite at the time. Mm -hmm. Switching wineskins without spilling requires careful steps. First thing to do is lay down the proper scriptural foundation. No big bang on a Sunday morning. <laughs> No Big Bang Theories. Just whack it. Boom. <laughs> Nobody's left, but... <laughs> at, least, at least I'm on my own island. Look at this apostolic center. <laughs> we want saints journeying with the Holy Spirit, not congregates who are shocked by a sudden change in direction. So with their, fo their first year was preparation which even I've received words prophetically that last year, that really was the focus last year, was preparation. And this year, it's going to be more of the shift, really seeing it become reality. My dear friend Marty has been praying a lot of <laughs> the same exactly things. Marty, intercessor, Marty and Jan are always praying for this, so thank them for that. I systematically use the Sunday platform to instill vision and build momentum while delegating the pastoral care to cell leaders and pastors during the week. So that's a big key for me, too. I can really move forward in this because of delegating 
responsibility to the elders of doing a lot of the work that I was doing. Mm -hmm. Now they're doing it, and so I can really focus on just this, sing this thing through. You will see that I never put any emphasis on the office of the apostle itself. That first year, I didn't find it necessary. I focused instead on the apostolic nature of the church, which led us to reconsider our corporate structure and mandate. The only reason, you know, Pastor Steve decided to put the word apostle, Josh Kennedy, up on the sign there, but, um, and I started using that name even though I was ordained as an apostle in 2011, but I waited till 2018 to kind of use that title and other apostles have recognized that title, that not title really, that gift. And the reason mainly is just to teach us all that they're not just pastors in leadership, that there's different forms of leadership. Scripturally though, you don't see anybody rec named apostle. They always put their first name because you go by your name, who you are first. It's not a title, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. So you don't put it in front of your name. That's very good. Say that again, what you say? It's not a title, it's a gift, so you don't put it in front of your name. You put titles in front of names. You put gifts, it's just gifts. It doesn't identify who you are. It's just what God does through you, but it's what God does through you. A title is something a person earns. Mm -hmm. My God. You go through Bible school, you get a title, you can get, maybe now you can call yourself reverend or whatever. Mm -hmm. but spiritually, yes, mm -hmm. but also I think Oh yeah. 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 Hey, and it's a way to yeah. It's a way to honor God, and people need to know who's. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just recognizing the gifts in the body to know how each person serves. So. In a body like this, if somebody came new, they'd, need, they'd want to know who the pastor is. Sure. And now maybe they'd learn and say, oh, there's not just pastors in leadership. There's also apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers. Who does what? And so because we have for so long used the title, which is the gift, pastor for leadership, yeah. I feel like it's a time until maybe there will be a season maybe where we get past all that. But in our culture, at this point right now, the leader of a church, the leader of a group of people was either called a, past, is called a pastor, typically. So we're educating that there's not just pastors in leadership of a church. And that's why I use the gift, apostle. So, uh, you know, and people can call me that if they feel led to. They can call me pastor, they can call me whatever. But, you know, you know them by their gifts. But people need to understand the gifts in order to recognize that. And something that you have emphasized and I think that's just, this is important because she said that, you know, leaderships have to be, you know, recognized and honored because they are the leader. But we have to go back to the Word of God. And the Word of God says that we're to serve one another. We're to honor one another. And for too long, for way too long, there's been this, because I have this title, therefore you have to look up to me. And we serve alongside each other. There's one head, his name is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's true that two heads is a monster, but I say this all the time. Usually the one that you hear that coming from is the one saying, I'm the head. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are a monster because okay. Jesus is the head. Yeah. And we're all the body and every part is important. No matter how grand your job might appear, or how, how low your job might appear. Every part is important. Somebody drives a Mercedes, but somebody has to build it. Somebody has to fix it. Somebody has to gas it. Without the gas, your fancy bins is not going. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> and if you use the name of Jesus, but you're not aligned with him as your head, you're a headless horseman. <laughs> You know? I want to preach that message someday. It's been in me for years. Holy Spirit, give me an opportunity to preach headless horsemen just for leadership. It's some kind of leadership gathering, but 
But um, yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> Jeff? Yeah. You know, but this um, video is not just for praise. Yeah. Again, the, yeah. This is for all the region, but it's part of us becoming apostolic centers under the region, understanding how we serve the region, you know? So it's for everyone. Yeah. Let's just look quickly through, um, we're not going to really hit that, but you look on how this church, La Chemin, <laughs> and Elaine Caron, Apostle Elaine Caron, shifted. And we'll go right ahead past all that. Page 77. <laughs> Whenever our current, page 76, that bold statement there, whenever our current paradigm goes through a change, a corresponding adjustment in the structure will be needed. And so that's where we're at right now, adjusting structure. There's no use in criticizing the old, just paint a picture of the new until it becomes a clear and attractive model. People naturally desire to migrate toward that model after a while. On uh, the second paragraph on page 77, I discovered that as long as we kept the discussion about the apostolic model at a conceptual level, the waters were not too troubled. But as soon as I started going down the path of reforming the church government, a number of insecurities suddenly came to the surface. People don't have a problem with the concepts when we touch the structure that we need to be careful. Their main structure changed that when it became really a challenge where wine could be spilled was when they um, changed from having a board of elders to having an apostolic team. Now, I'm not saying we're going to shift that here, because again, every place is different. We may remain, keep our elders as they are. That's what we're doing. Uh, it's just a different approach that we're having. Um, but what I'm trying to develop is an apostolic team for our region of people, of leaders of different body, different churches. So I'm looking for kingdom-minded. Doesn't mean that they're all apostles. An apostolic team means you want to have a multi-gifted group of people that are all kingdom-minded, that have the same heart, same desire, who will kind of um, oversee the region and use the, the, the grace in each person's life to work together with their... It's just like a, um, when a battle comes, you got different generals, and the generals come together, and they, and they see how they can work together, how they can strategize, how they can use their soldiers together because their unit is too small for certain battles. So you got to team up. That's right. So we've got to just see how we can team up. So I'm hoping I have an ap apostolic team that's developing. <laughs> but the difficulty I think we're going to have, especially in this country, because this is a work that's going on all over the world, but the difficulty with America is that we're independent. And it's a good thing that we're independent as a nation. You know, there's a reason we got fought for independence. From, but the independent spirit is upon us. And a lot of the churches I work with are independent churches. We are an independent church. So everybody likes to remain independent of each other. And so the thing with being a team is you got to be a team. Can't be independent, all about I. So I think this is a process in the working that may take some time. But one thing that can change is often some kind of major happening in our culture, our society, that brings people together. So God may have a way to bring us all together, but we are a work in progress. But um, the independent is difficult. Nobody wants to submit to any other leader. Everybody wants to be their own leader, and everyone wants to do their own thing. And everyone wants everybody to join into their thing. <laughs> you know, and so we can get all into joining everybody's thing, and then you're exhausted because you're everywhere all the time. So how do you actually work together as one? Christian organizations on the campus. And 
I, I got saved in Campus Crusade for Christ, which is an idea. I didn't get saved through them, but I joined them. Their philosophy is when Bill was saved. I was their worst disciple. <laughs> Right. I didn't build, and I didn't sin. <laughs> I did build in myself. I hated salvation. But one thing I observed was is that you, you had that group which would win people to Christ, but they they had a, a shallow foundation, and we had different groups that were really into learning the Word of God, and they were just focused on that. Some were. And then there were some that were real Pentecostal, and then there were some that were charismatic. And just everybody had their own little niche. And I was like, this is very interesting. And when I think of the apostolic center part and building a team, is you I would think that I don't know if this is true or not, but you'd be like, okay. He has this type of trait, and she has this type of trait, and this one has this type, of, and then you pull them together and you build this team. Mm -hmm. Well, let's make it larger. The Apostolic Center isn't about the church and just the team that we have. Mm -hmm. It's about the greater body of Christ. So as I mentioned about the different groups, at Penn State has different strengths. Mm -hmm. Different churches have different strengths. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we have to learn what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. And then you pull from this one and you pull from that church and you pull from this church and you make the team. Uh, this yeah. just, yep. just roll around. And around. No, it's good. That's, that's, that's basically where we're at. That's the objective. We got to know each other first. We got to see each other's strengths and weaknesses. Then wisdom will come. Yeah. And accept the strength of someone else. And you yeah. have to be willing to allow yourself to be subject mm -hmm. to other people mm -hmm. to be able to, to work. Yeah. Uh, and that can only be the Spirit of God yeah. uh, for that to happen. Yeah. But I, this is just rolling around in my head. I wonder if this is kind of where it's headed. Yeah, that's where I'm hoping. Exactly. That's where it's heading. That's, that's the kingdom model. You know, there's a lot of groups, and there's a lot of... <laughs> I want to hit, hit this no spilling before we close out. I think that's important. Bottom of 77. In order to make the transition from a traditional local church and apostolic center, the leader needs to be either... The leader needs to either be an apostle or be aligned with an apostle who is ready to be directly involved in the process. There are two warnings I would give before going further. First, don't play the apostle if you don't have the calling. There are already too many wannabes. <laughs> it's not helping anyone. I need this. If you don't got it, you don't got it. Just you got something else though. Everybody got something. <laughs> if you're born again, every one of us have grace. Just know the grace. Know God's grace in your life and don't try to have somebody else's grace. How can we have somebody else's grace? You can't have somebody else's grace because only the Holy Spirit gives it. Yeah, you can't take it from somebody. Impart that grace. <laughs> can't happen unless God wants you to have it. People are running to one thing after another, trying to get an impartation so they can get something that God ain't going to give them because God gave them something else. <laughs> Just You got Jesus. And whatever part Jesus has you is an important part. There's no less important. We see that when it describes the parts of the body. Every part is important. So we just got to be satisfied with whatever part we are because when we're not satisfied, we're really pointing our finger at God and saying, why did you make me this way? Yeah. No. <laughs> Seek rather to enter into a healthy alignment with an apostle who will help you flourish in your mandate. Second, if you do have an apostolic calling, don't use your authority in a domineering way. The house of God is a relational house and leaders need to be able to win the hearts of their fellow brothers and sisters. The apostolic shift is not to be made by imposing a vision on others. We better become this apostolic center. If you don't like it, get out of here. You know, that kind of attitude. It's not going to work. Who do I think I am, you know? It's all about the Lord. 
The apostolic shift is not to be made by opposing a vision on others or by dictating to the congregation what their lives will become. Apostolic authority, we all have free will. Got to let everyone have their free will. We can't control and force anybody to do anything. We can speak the word of God, but they got to receive it and run with it for themselves. All right. Yeah, just write it. If you, um, there's note pages too, if you want to, and you can just clip, cut, you can keep the book and cut those things out, you know, and yeah, and I can uh, just, I can even give them back after I look them over. Um, let's look at that last part. I think it kind of uh, puts it all together in kind of an outline type form, and then we'll close in prayer. Page 82, how to list. Before you start, Keep Jesus the center. And make sure he stays at the center. As long as he's at the center, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Things are going to move forward in his timing. Secondly, desire to give him the church he longs for, not that we long for. Be ready to follow life before structure. Refuse the maintenance mode. We're not just going to maintain, we're going to grow. Adopt the kingdom mindset. Be ready to switch wineskins. Assess your foundations. Understand where you've come from before you step forward. Very important thing. That's what we've been doing. That's also part of what we as elders did even going into our 40th year before we moved forward into now our 41st year as a ministry is identify maybe some of the issues that we needed to resolve and deal with. And that's... Um, part of what was taking place last year. Things that might not have been resolved. Making sure if there's anything we can do to resolve. Sometimes there's things you can't resolve. Sometimes there's an issue with somebody that passed away. You, yeah, you, you know, do what you can before the Lord, but you can't deal with somebody who's not alive. Know where you stand. Find points of continu continuity to link your future to your past. Build on your value system. Third, study and teach the basics. Study the base model for spiritual community in Acts 2. Study the Acts 13 shift with the initial apostolic base in, Ant in Antioch. So that's work for you guys to do. Study the development with Paul, teams, local churches, centers, networks. Move from the inner to the outer circles. Start by building agreement with those closer to you. Secure the closest circles before moving to the next ones. Remember, Jesus primarily, well, his most... His inner circle was Peter and John. You know, and then the disciples, there was another ten of them. So you have to have an inner circle. You can't be that close with everybody. You can only be so close with so many people. So you've got to know and identify who your inner circle really is. Then there's the outer circles. You ought to have outer circles. You still have an impact. But it's, it's much more with your inner circle. Secure the closest circles before moving to the next ones. Try building unity with leaders before going to the larger body. That's what we've been trying to do. And even with the larger body, we're just teaching scripture. We're not really getting in depth like we are in this class, unless they watch it on YouTube. <laughs> uh, move forward properly. Don't rush the journey, which I like to do. Disclose the vision gradually, one bite at a time. After 14 years, no. Don't take the congregation by surprise. Communicate, 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 and communicate in bite, in size, bite-sized chunks. Switch wineskins without spilling. Last part here. Honor the previous wineskin. Use Sunday gatherings to instill vision and build momentum. Present a clear and attractive model until people naturally desire to migrate. Delegate pastoral care to cell leaders or pastors. Focus on the apostolic call of the church. Delegate pastoral care to call leaders or pastors or elders. <laughs> Focus on the apostolic call of the church rather than the, on the office of the apostle. Rally people, win their hearts. That's important. Don't be a dictator. People don't like dictators. They don't like somebody who's not connected to them. So even though I'm, I, you know, my main calling is to work with leaders, I must work with everyone. 
to some degree, I have to connect with people. They're not going to follow a vision if they're not connected. We don't have a heart-to-heart -heart connection. So that's why I make it a point to, you know, be in the back, shaking hands, connecting with people, greeting people, talking to people, doing whatever I can. I can't connect intimately with everyone, but at least there has to be some level of connection. Avoid casualties and save friendships. Don't stop halfway. Celebrate each step and finish strong. All right, we got through it. One of these weeks, we got to go through three chapters. <laughs> so I'm going to try to find which is a... Might be next week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good to pray, right? Close out, and we're 10 minutes over. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all we've received. Thank you, Lord, for that which is of Holy Spirit remains. And Holy Spirit, you'll bring it out. You'll help us apply it to our life. Help each of us do our part in what you've called us to do and what you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, for some of us here are part of this apostolic center. Some of us are in other ministries but are connected. And we thank you, Lord, that your grace is at work in us. And we just bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.